Good evening. I've created a presentation this evening to show the importance of and the collection of digital evidence and the challenges that pertain to it in the field. <clears throat> now, one of the first things that we can address here is the fact that Hollywood has created a theme that this process is quick and efficient and very easy to do. Um, however, there are numerous other factors that influence it and provide some challenges to retrieving information in an ethical and efficient man manner. <clears throat> some of these challenges are first and foremost, becoming a certified um, individual in an accredited program. Second would be the Fourth Amendment, third of person's right to privacy, and lastly, the actual process of discovering and handling digital evidence pro professionally and properly. <clears throat> now let us first begin by looking at becoming a certified forensic examiner. What this does is it's going to create an accredited standard that we are held to and recognized by organization and courts across the country. <clears throat> This is done by going through a formal training process at the end in which there is an examination process that we must undergo, both a actual written exam as well as in many cases a practical exam um, where we would actually have to recover digital evidence properly and efficiently in a timely manner <clears throat> and then reiterate that information back to the examiners themselves. Uh, in order to keep this process fluent and up to date and with current events with new technologies that are coming out, there is certain examinations that we would need to recertify in over a period of time so that way we can keep our accreditation as a certified examiner. Some of the top certified examination programs are uh, CCE, which would be a certified computer examiner, a cert certified forensic examiner or CFE, uh, CCFP, a cer certified cyber forensic professional, or an access data certified examiner. <clears throat> Now, a lot of these different examinations are put out there by organizations that have created um, a reputable standard that would typically have 5,000 or more individuals that were in their program. <clears throat> and that's not to say that other organizations that have created uh, forensic certifications are invalid or don't have any integrity, but it does mean that maybe they're newer or they're just not very popular with people, they could cost too much, or there's a variety of factors that could pertain to individuals not taking part in their programs. The top organizations are recognized by Tittle, um, as I just said, as having 5,000 or more certified individuals. Per now in doing this, as cyber forensic professionals, as I'll use as a term throughout this presentation to describe us, <clears throat> professionals are entrusted to maintain data integrity, which is kind of defined as completeness, accuracy, and verifiability. What this means is that the data that we recover is going to be complete and whole. Even though we might recover portions of file, we have done it properly. We've done it accurately in that we haven't used any external methods that might be deemed questionable um, to retrieve that information. And then we have verifiability, which would be the process in which we're able to verify our steps and someone else could actually replicate the process we did to a T and get the same result at the end of their examination. What this does is it prevents investigators from making up data and ensures that proper procedures are taken to recover the data. <clears throat> this leads us into the Fourth Amendment, which is defined as protecting individuals against unreasonable search and seizures. Now, some of us might think that this only pertains to physical search and seizures. However, they would be incorrect because this actually does pertain to digital um, evidence as well, as, such as emails, phone conversations, um, files on your computer even. So it's going to create a definitive guideline that allows professionals um, to protect the rights of the accused, much similar to we have our rights as a person to not be physically just searched without reason. Now the reason why this is so different is there's actually a two-step process involved in this defined by Kerr. The first step would be searching the physical location for the evidence. This is where most physical investigations would stop and we would then just take that information, that evidence into custody and examine it further, <clears throat> just looking at the physical features of it. However, when pertaining to digital evidence, we'll actually take the media into custody and then search that media itself, looking for files, looking for other factors that could be within a computer, a cell phone, um, even a PlayStation 4 could be something that would be searched and seized uh, by some uh, individuals. <clears throat> so in this regard, searches can uncover other information that would be sensitive to the individual being investigated. Some of this personal information could be defined as a social security number, maybe their relationship status, maybe it was a married individual that was having an affair 
that information could be made public. Um, medical or tax information, but there are other things that we could look at that might fall into this category. Those are just to name a few. So this leads us into the rights of privacy of the accused or those being investigated, whether it's not an individual, it could be a corporation <clears throat> where we wouldn't want to expose any of their tax information, employees information, such as their social security numbers, addresses, and furthermore, um, other sensitive data that we might find. So this would be the right to privacy of an individual would be requiring potentially a second warrant in order to investigate. The reason for this is because they might stumble upon an email account in one course of the investigation and then they would need to access that email account because it could have a link and a direct tie to the investigation in question. Well, if that email account was not on the computer or if it was just on a remote device that nobody had real access to, we would actually be able to look at the email provider and serve them a warrant to, <clears throat> a subpoena actually, to obtain that information. <clears throat> Um, some other information that could fall into this are separate user accounts. Um, if there was a user on a computer that maybe was a child's, a spouse's, or even a friend's, maybe that information could be protected um, and a second warrant might be needed in order to access that information. This would be very case dependent depending on what the crime was in question. Um, but in my personal opinion, I would say we would need to be better safe than sorry and check with a supervisor or issue go to a judge and get a second warrant in order to do that. <clears throat> so these standards of privacy, as I've just defined, we need to look at them subjectively. And by subjectively, I mean, what would a reasonable person define as private? What would you find as private and personal information that would require a warrant to search? Um, if we, you and I were having a personal conversation over, say, Facebook, that might be considered private because it's just you and me talking. If we were having a conversation in public, that type of conversation might not be considered private because we're out in the open. We're talking about it freely in a public setting. Um, from here, when we look at this, now we have to understand what are some of the ethics of searches. First and foremost, we got to understand that our personal goals in trying to catch a criminal or find out who committed some sort of crime or breach in a security system cannot allow us to alter the course of our investigation, which would mean that our morals would actually be tested. We could potentially, and we do have the power to manipulate and change data in order to implicate somebody. Um, wanting to put a pedophile or a murderer in prison is not justification to bend the rules and regulations pertaining to the investigative process. We'd want to use unique, these processes um, specifically, and techniques that were <clears throat> accepted by experts as suitable during the course of an investigation. So we essentially couldn't create our own program that we use to scan a computer and find information for. That actually could be very damaging to the case and what it would do is actually impede the case and potentially allow an innocent person to be incarcerated or a guilty person to go free in the eyes of the law. <clears throat> because of this, say there might be a time constraint on something, it doesn't mean that we can use that as a reason to cut some corners in the case or potentially do something that might be unethical, such as manipulating data or even cutting a few corners on scans and leaving out important information. <clears throat> in this regard, it leads us into maintaining a proper change of custody so that the data is accounted for at all times and we always know where the location of it is. That way, if this was in a courtroom, they could actually trace through signatures and documentation where the data was from the time it was retrieved by the law enforcement professionals and then how it got to the courtroom. So we could see physically where it went at every point in time. <clears throat> and this is why the storage and integrity of the data is so important. While we might find information on a system that could damage um, the case we're investigated, it must be represented as evidence. Even if there's something that might be counterintuitive to what a testimony might have given, it still needs to be presented for. We cannot say that we would want to leave that evidence out and just hope that nobody catches it. Because what if the defense, or if we were the defense, if the prosecution found out about that, then we would be implicated and we could potentially lose our accreditation as a cyber forensics investigator. <clears throat> and in regards to this, it helps reinforce the fact that we would need to preserve the information as a whole. Um, by this, we mean to 
isolate, secure, and then preserve the evidence by not allowing to modif anything to modify or destroy it. So this would be any external factors, such as other individuals um, having access to the data itself, uh, specifically <clears throat> allowing things to potentially breach the chain of custody, um, or really anything regarding the data being out of our hands. Presenting this information in a clear and concise manner is probably the last portion of this that we can cover. Basically, providing a clear defined report um, using visuals or graphics to help show what happened in a crime, how we were able to find that information, and what that information <clears throat> related to as far as a drink, a direct correlation from the evidence we gathered to the crime itself. <clears throat> what this means is we have a uh, specific computer jargon that we might know as forensic professionals that we would use in order to you know, define how we found information, talking about Slack space, talking about you know, even hard drives or RAM, um, any sort of memory information, maybe a jury won't understand what that is. So creating a visual graphic, a chart, diagrams, in order to show how this information is important and why this pertains to the case and why this might implicate or prove innocence of an individual is so important when presenting this information in a clear and concise manner to uh, court, to um, <clears throat> potentially a board of directors of a company. So that way they understand exactly what you did, how you did it, and the information, and that the information has validity. <clears throat> so in conclusion, I would say that this is probably one of the most personal topics that I could think of, specifically because recently I finished up a grand jury trial um, or numerous grand jury cases where I had to sit and listen to testimony pertaining to uh, pedophilia and individuals who had to examine this data and the amount of fortitude they must have had in order to maintain a high standard of professionalism when handling this evidence is beyond me. Um, however, having a child of my own, I know that I would be able to handle this with integrity and responsibility to go forward and know that I am doing the greatest good to ensure that these individuals are put away and not able to do this again. <clears throat> I would like to thank you for taking the time to review this presentation that I presented before you and look forward to hearing your responses. Take care.